Good afternoon again. Um, thank you for joining us for our last session, short session, about a project of technical theater history canon. So um, uh, let me welcome here Chris von Gettem. The stage is yours. Hello. Yes. Okay. So I'll try to keep it short. People that know me know that I'm very good in that. But the first thing I have to do is change the theme of this whole symposium. And what we've been talking about, uh, where are we? And we're going to talk a little bit of where were we? So we have to change that a little bit. I'm going to talk about a European project that is called Can the Canon of Theatre Technical History. And it's a project with uh, nine partners in total from countries a little bit all over Europe. And what we try to do is uh, get grip on the history of technical theater. We figured out that a lot is lost. There is not very much attention on this history of the technical theater, what you see in the background, the equipment and so on. And that is crucial to be able to understand a performance 50 years later, to understand uh, that you need to understand how the technology works. I give a very concrete example. I'm working on a production now with sets from 1910. If we want to light them in a proper way, we need to know how the lighting system works. That was a bit uh, the start. And what's more, we want to create, in, uh, increase more awareness about uh, uh, this technical heritage. I say in Europe because it's a European pro uh, project, so the focus now is on Europe, but in the future we would like to extend that also to the rest of the world. And what's pretty important is because we come from all these different countries, they all have a different view and a different vision on this history. If you live in Spain, you look differently to the history of technology than if you live in Belgium or in Sweden. Strange enough, but that's a quite interesting experience. Okay, what do we do? We do a lot of research, of course. We do a lot of online work, especially in the last two years. We've been working a lot with all our students together online, and we tried all kinds of different systems like Miro, where they uh, uh, research together uh, online. We do student workshops, and the first one, finally, after two years and a half, is next week in uh, Stockholm, where we come together with all our students from the school. So we, I think we have 40 students uh, all over the place. And we do teachers' workshop, where we do very serious work and discuss with each other about very serious subjects. Maybe I should tell a little bit about what we think heritage is. It's the picture you see here, for the older people among you, they all will know what that is. It's a Revox recorder. Okay. One of my students said at one moment, isn't, isn't the picture upside down? Because the wheels are on the upside. <laughs> they had no clue what this thing was. And this was 20 years ago, was standard equipment in almost every theater. So everything that is not really used anymore, that is kind of getting out of date for us is, is heritage, which gives us some nice conflicts with people from collections and museums that say it has to be 100 years old and stuff. And we said, if you wait 100 years, it will be disappeared and you'll never find it back. Okay. So, the project is done, is uh, working in five different parts. Uh, the first part is the stories. We, you'll hear more about that in a second. We're working on teaching tools. We're working on methodology. We create a timeline and um, we try to create a network. And I hope by the end of this talk, you all will be part of our network. I brought some specialists in. So this slide is absolutely what uh, Brie is working on. And that's about the story. So I, I would give it so hi, uh, welcome also from me. Uh, I'm uh, Brine Wesley from Berlin, teaching uh, scenography and uh, theatre architecture there for students of uh, theatre and event technology. And that's also 
how our project is working, it's very interdisciplinary. We do um, on, on scenographic uh, studies, on architectural studies, but also uh, technicians. And here we try to find out the 100 most important stories of all our European history. And uh, started to, yeah, it's a lot of selecting and discussing because all of uh, us with the different views of the different countries and cultures um, have different uh, approaches. And also the time frames, because also knowledge is traveling and periods are not the same. Um, it's, it's a big challenge to, to, to find out what we can yeah, ask uh, or, or um, have for, for the knowledge um, now in, in, in 10 fields and uh, 10 time frames. But we also want to, to tell stories in a bit between, not only um, historically or um, by topic or by region, but also when people met to create a new milestone, for example, technically, but also uh, artistically. And um, now we will work next week uh, a lot on, on that, maybe also creating a, a card game to, as, a, as a teaching tool. And that uh, lets me really uh, pass over, I think, to Anders, to the methodologies, or what? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so. This is the right one. Okay. The one. <laughs> so, I pass to Anders. Thank you very much. My name is Anders Larsson. I'm coming from Sweden. Uh, as you see all the logos down there, you can see that they represent a lot of different uh, schools, universities. Um, I'm teaching technical theater and production management and coordination of productions. Um, my part is to be re responsible for the methodology and um, I just want to give you some example. Uh, we are very lucky in Sweden, you are very lucky here in Czech Republic. You have Czechsny Kromlo Court Theatre. In Stockholm we have uh, Drottningholm Court Theatre and also Confidence in Court Theatre. And, um, I take these as examples of how you could use a methodology to teach, for example, um, scene changes, how you could teach uh, me mechanical uh, problems or solutions. And um, we use that for, uh, when we teach, we have different uh, ways to approach how to teach. And what we're trying to find out, if we could collect all these good ideas together and there uh, during our collection could spread good ideas uh, from this project to other teaching uh, schools. Uh, what more to say? Um, well, uh, what's I? Yeah, the result will be an, actually an, an, um, a database also, a collection of all these good examples of, yes, if we want to get, in, get inspired of how to teach, for example, uh, the light, where could we start? We could start with the candlelight, and it's a good example from different universities how you use old technique, in this case, candlelight, to show uh, light problems, and you go on from that to actually use it in other contexts. I think that's, in short, what we want to say. Good. So then the next thing, unfortunately, I'm out of experts now, so I have to tell it myself. The next thing is uh, uh, teaching tools. We're trying to get uh, to create tools that people can use to teach. Um, which can be 3D drawings to understand better historical uh, machinery, for example. We're working on a new translation of Sabatini because we consider that as an extreme uh, important uh, book. In Spain, for example, they made a video of the uh, dialogues of the Somi, which is basically 
a kind of a learning text about uh, how to stage, how to use costumes and, and that type of stuff. So we try to create all this type of uh, things that people can use afterwards in their courses. And to give you one idea, uh, this is the type of drawings they're trying to make uh, for Sabatini. So on one hand, you will have an, a new translation. And on the other hand, you will have literally step by step all the drawings on how to build a theater uh, as it was in the Renaissance time. So in the end result will be a 3D model that can uh, be used uh, in classes and so on based on our interpretation of the original uh, Italian text. This one we've had, and then I get to my absolute favor own uh, point, is the database. Is what we realized is that, in fact, there is a lot of information about this history, but it's extremely spread. There's a museum that has four parts. There is 12 little text in a, in a collection somewhere. Sometimes there is 12 pages in a, a, a book of 3,000 pages. So it's very hard to find. And sometimes you just have to be lucky to find it. I found uh, in, a, in a book about air conditioning from 1900, I found six pages about how do you have to do the air conditioning for gas lighting. And there it becomes interesting. For the chance that you find that by searching by Google is pretty small. On top of that, we realize that if you have a lot of information, it's very hard to grab it. If I give you 3,000 dates, it doesn't make sense anymore for you. So th the second thing that was quite important for us is to visualize it and to make, it, uh, uh, to make the access of the information different so you start to look at different things. A nice example is uh, we've all uh, discussed uh, uh, Dresden and Appia, and we've discussed what happened uh, uh, Hellerau and Appia, and we also discussed what happened in Dresden, and nobody of us realized that uh, Hellerau is a part of Dresden. If you don't see that in, a, in a, a visual way, you don't understand that. So visualization is an important thing, and we wanted to make it in a way that it would be widely accessible for everyone. So we want to make everything open source, and we want to make it in a, in a way that people can access it from all kinds of uh, different ways. In the long run, it should become a, a collaborating platform in the way that other people that are doing research could put their own information in there and enrich the, the collection we build up uh, together. And we absolutely want to safeguard the information. If you look around the internet, you see fantastic information about Roman theaters, Greek theaters, uh, historical words, all that type of thing. And if you start digging a little bit deeper, you find out, oh, this site was made by a professor that is retired 10 years ago. And the only thing you need to do is wait till somebody switches off the server. And then all the information will be gone. So what we try to do is gather all this information together so we can safeguard all this work that is done by uh, different people. At the moment, we are very much what we call harvesting information. So we're trying to go to uh, large databases, to interest, uh, interesting websites, and so on. And we try to take out all this information and bring it together in a database. The, at the moment, uh, they calculated yesterday, we have 9,734 theaters in there, for example. And that's a combination for all kind of uh, different databases that we uh, brought together. Um, that's just one example. Another example is, and now I'm going to say digital theater words for some people. We took the whole corpus of digital theater words, and we used that as a standardized language which means if you will be looking at on, uh, one of the words of digital theater words, you will also get sources about that, and you will start to see relations, and use, uh, relations with people, relations with theaters, relations with countries. So we try to get all this information together in a way that we can show it in many different uh, ways. And we are asking to everyone, if you have information, please, can we use it? There are some people have thousands of pictures in their computers. I'm not talking about specific people now. It would be great if we could tag them in a way that you find them back 
and that you get the, the right information with the right theater and the right information with the right equipment. And so bit by bit, we build up kind of a, a common library, let's say. An example, imagine that you want to write the history of PQ. Imagine. Uh, there is a lot of information about that. Almost every country has a magazine that wrote one or two articles about it. At least they wrote one article before PQ and they will write one after PQ. And now try to get them together. That's horrible. What we want to do, and we did that already with the, the uh, uh, Flemish magazines, we are working now on the German magazines, we have some Dutch magazines. We bring all these magazines together we put them in, a, in a, a big database and we tag them. And one of the tags will be PQ. Which means at one moment you will see, if you click on the, on the term uh, PQ, you will see all the magazines from all the different countries that have been writing about this. Which gives you a way richer uh, information source than if you only would look in uh, your own country. It's just one example. Of course we don't stop with magazines, because we can put pictures in there, we can put stories in there. There have been uh, uh, recorded stories uh, from uh, people that, that uh, visited. Uh, we can look in the archives here, of course. There will be a lot of information. There is a lot of books uh, written about that. So if you bring all that together, you get, you get a real enriched uh, uh, source. Now, PQ, PQ, of course, is made by people and by organizations. So the moment we put that in there, it also links directly to the individual designer or the individual organization that has organized uh, a boot, which also means that in the next step, you will be able to see to your own organization and look at the history of your organization, what have they done and where have they participated and, and stuff like that. Okay. It's just one example. I have a couple of others. I said already that we work on a, a list of theaters. They are also, if there is a new theater built or it burns down, mostly people write articles about that. Uh, we have pictures, stories, archives. Interesting enough, we also find a lot of catalogs that refer to we have uh, furnished the equipment for this theater at that one uh, moment in time. Uh, we find uh, uh, collections that have collected uh, uh, people's archive, for example, that describe a lot of different uh, theaters, like the... the, uh, Arch the Arch yeah, you can say that, bit, but the Architecture uh, Museum in Berlin and the Freie University of Berlin, they both have a kind of a large, uh, extensive collection of that. So in that way, you get information for all kinds of uh, sites about that. And then we talk about visualization. So th this is just a, a, a snapshot of uh, some theaters. But by putting them on a timeline, you start to see other things. I was, last week, I was in, in a book that was very unclear, trying to figure out which theater was the new opera of Berlin in uh, 1860 because it's in a book you just say it's a new opera and everybody understands it because it was a new opera in that time. It's not a new opera now. And by comparing the, the timeline of Berlin with what they had written, it was rather easy to figure out which theater that was. It's just one example. Of course, theaters are in a specific place. We kind of put them on a map so you can have an idea of where uh, the theaters are. And uh, we also put them in kind of a tree structure. Some people like to work very structured. Some people like more maps. You get both information based on the same uh, uh, starting point of what we have. And you can not only look at the, uh, the theaters, you can also say, OK, what happened in this country? And then you will get a map of the theaters in the country, a list of the theaters. You get the timeline of the theater of this country. Uh, you get also which collections that are in, in that country. And surprisingly, some people, when I say, oh, but in your city there is a fantastic collection, they say, really? I don't know. So by structuring that, you get all this information uh, together. Persons that are connected to, that are born there, that have been working there, or so on. So you get kind of an overview of a country, or uh, a city, or uh, a region. And in that way, um, you have another entry 
point uh, for the information. Uh, we're looking at equipment because that was the, the first goal. It turned a little bit out of hand, to be honest, but that's always like that with databases and theater words. Uh, so we're having a tree of equipment, but then at the end you get to the unique equipment that was there. And one thing we discovered, it's extremely difficult to date equipment. And the reason for that is if somebody makes a, a promotion folder uh, for new equipment, they don't want to put a date on that because then next year they're selling old equipment. So what we are trying to do is based on the publicity in magazines to date which equipment uh, was, was built in what time till what time. So you get an overview of, okay, that's the equipment uh, in that time. Um, it also gives you a timeline. It also gives you uh, a structure. It, it's basically the same. We try to give every type of visualization we have based on the information we have. If we don't have date information, you won't get dates. If we don't have geographical information, which doesn't make much sense for spotlights because they're quite movable, then you won't get uh, a map. Okay. I get back to digital theater words, our favorite subject. And one of the things is what we try to do is make a controlled language. It's a very abstract term that comes from the library sector, but they use the same word for the same thing. If there is one thing that we are extremely good at in theater is use the same word for different things and different words for the same thing. By using a controlled language, you say, okay, if I say this, I mean this. And that makes it possible to find things back. Because often you're looking at something and you miss, you miss a lot of information because it's named differently. Also. By starting from digital theater words, the advantage is you can look up the same word in at least 20 different languages. So that makes it a little bit uh, more stronger. That's the starting point. But then when we're building our collection, let's say, we find new words, we add them. We also, and that's uh, another more historical thing, we also look up into old dictionaries, for example, is, okay, did this word exist in 1800? Did this word exist in 1700? And so you can start to see when a term occurs and probably when a technology occurs. Or in the case of occupations, for example, is what is the first sonographer? When does the term sonographer occur? When does the, the term uh, designer occur? And in that way, by, by listing these historical terms under uh, a central term, we really get an overview of, okay, what happened at one moment? When is the moment when uh, the kind of manager split out into the, the director on one hand and the stage manager on the other hand, for example? You can see that because then the terminology is starting to be used in different countries. So what we create is all theater words. I'm almost there. Uh, we create old uh, theater words. It looks a little bit like that. You can see that all online. Uh, and we create a huge source database, and everything works in both ways. So if you put a source in and you tag it, then it tags automatically the other side. Um, and now you say, yes, you talk about all these old people having databases, and you're an old person, and you're creating a database. Yes, but we build it based on the Wikidata system. So if ever we would say, okay, we want to stop with this, we can export all the information and it would stay in Wikidata. And the, uh, the chance that Wikidata will end up is uh, pretty small. And then I get to the last, last point very fast, is we want to create this awareness and that type of stuff, but we want to engage you. In a way, you have information we don't have. You have information we don't even, or we're not even to read, able to read. So if you think we have a collection here or a list here or whatever, please contact us. And please say, okay, I have this list, you can, you can uh, use this. We integrate it and in return, you get your list back from us with the Wikidata links on it. So you can import it in Wikidata and then the, your list will be there for the rest of, uh, well, at least my life. Good, thank you very much. <laughs>